Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to another LinkedIn Live. Today we're talking about why my best people become silent. Um, Tirza, it's not uncommon for leaders to give a town hall presentation, give an inspirational talk about where the company is headed, present the strategic outlook, maybe even announce really important change that is happening, and then crickets. And so that happens even when it's pretty apparent that there are questions, right? I've been in those town halls myself, and I knew many people like me um, who weren't shy to speak up, but still felt reluctant in doing so in those situations. And so in the worst case, your best employees sometimes choose to be silent and, you know, may even leave organizations. So what is what is happening? Why are people silent? Um, how can leaders break that? And, you know, they get super, fr it's super frustrating when there's crickets. So how, how do you, what is happening? And yeah, how do you, how do you go about breaking the ice? Yeah. Thanks so much, Helena. This is such a great topic. I myself have been also in these meetings where, um, somebody presents something and, um, and very few, you know, people or nobody says anything. Um, and there's a lot of things going on in that situation. Um, but the most, some of the, the most useful things to look at is, um, as a leader, as the one who's wanting to come, um, and like present something that has, um, undergone layers of, um, like articulation and iteration and they, and now feels ready to share. There's a couple questions to ask. One, did you at all include people in the development of that message because if you didn't now you're like presenting something to people that feels um somehow finished and complete and which they had no participation in and um and don't have a clear understanding of what that means for them um, and they may not even be able to fully digest it because there's some of us that really want to take time to digest something before we like question back. And so even just the act of getting up and giving a big speech without giving people any kind of grounding ahead of time or inclusion, you've now really um, already broken several of the primary types of psychological safety. Timothy Clark has given us a really great framework for how to think about the core um, types of psychological safety. Um, the first one we talk about is um, like the safety to belong, to be here, to be included and inclusion safety. And when you don't include people in the act of creating something, um, and especially if we're now talking about something that like might include layoffs um, or transitions, like people now know they're excluded and they don't know if it's them. So like we've already broken inclusion and safety. Next type of safety we talk about is um, the safety to be in like a learning mode, to ask questions, to be curious. Um, in something like that, if the leader like isn't in a learning place themselves, then limbically we're not mirroring that, right? And so as a leader, mm -hmm. If you're going to come in and actually present something, one needs to be in a place where they are willing and ready and curious to hear people's responses. And oftentimes, as leaders in those moments, it's hard to be that. It's hard because, um, like, we we want to be right. <laughs> we want to be doing the best thing. Like, genuinely, we want to be doing the best thing. And so, when people come, if we're but if we're questioning ourselves or we're unwilling to be questioned, um, we or see questions as a threat rather than as opportunity to continue to learn, mm -hmm. then we're in our entire systems projecting, it's not safe to learn here. And if in the past we've shut down learning questions, then people aren't going to speak up. Or if within the organization, in our very large organizations, if people down the line haven't been speaking up, then like we're not going to speak up. So we've broken inclusion safety, we've broken learner safety. Now let's talk about contribution safety. If we didn't include people in that whole 
um, process, or we haven't really made it safe for them to add on to, to iterate our plan, to ask meaningful questions that are going to change what we're doing, then we have no space for co the contributor safety. We're not even willing to consider someone's opinion. Wow. And so like that's the, it, that exists in us. I know that there's like times when I feel like I've made a decision and I like don't want to hear like a response to that. I've done that with my son for sure. We just had a fight that was like that. And, uh, you know, all of us as leaders, many of us were raised at a time where our parents took um, like the child trying to offer learning um, as a direct threat to the family structure. Hmm. And so we it, we bring that into the workplace. So as leaders, we need to get real compassionate with ourselves that we're bringing forth patterns of behavior that were put into us in our schooling um, and in our um, families of origin that did not create psychological safety in the classroom um, or the family. And we're now just creating that like outward in our behavior. So mm -hmm. we've destroyed contributor safety. We've destroyed learner safety. We've destroyed... Um, belonging. And now, like, the last bit to really go here is challenger safety. This is a hard one. And I love that challenger safety is called challenger. And the one of the most um, epic disasters we've had in all of the space programs was the challenger explosion. It's the one a lot of people remember. And that explosion happened because there was an O-ring that failed. And the man who had des like designed that had said, we have not tested this O-ring at these temperatures and it might fail. He knew mm -hmm. that we didn't know that this was inside safety parameters. And his challenge was not listened to. And that rocket went off and exploded because that O-ring failed because it was too cold and it, it shrunk. Oh, my God. So even like a, a real safety challenge. Yeah, and not this just <laughs> exactly. This happens all the time, not just something, but really like because um, safety is limbic, not logical, we don't have a really good way of gauging um, an appropriate response to threat. We tend to register kind of threats very equally in our body, mm -hmm. such that our phone alarm going off um, and like actual real danger can land really similarly in our system. Safety mm -hmm. is not a logical. We can't logic our way into safety. We feel and resonate our way into safety. It's our mirror neurons and our limbic system. And it, we cannot logically override it. Think about anybody with claustrophobia. Claustrophobia is not a logical response. It's a limbic response. Hmm. So, as a leader, and I'll finish here, you haven't set up over time the willingness to be challenged and manage challenging responses. You won't get that. And because you may not even want that from the podium, you have to set those types of channels up differently so that people with deep challenges know the appropriate places to take those. I mean, that was golden right there. The, all of the different types of psychological safety that we have to pay attention to as a leader, right? <laughs> safety and and being able to, to participate that actually allows for participation, but also allowing particip participation in the right moment, right? And so it's like managing this dance between leadership and, and people and understanding how to build that relationship. And, you know, what, how, what areas are you building that? And I think what's even more powerful is if we want to improve the relationship with our people, we're improving the relationship first with ourselves, right? Because you're you're you were talking about how we may have all experienced as a child being shut down, not being allowed to contribute. You know, your parents are trying to make a decision during travel in the car, left or right turn. You as a kid decide to, hey mom, look at this, or why aren't we going this way? That looks cool. Not now. <laughs> like, you know, just these small little things mm -hmm. just happen. And we learn, oh, okay, I have to be very careful about when and how I bring myself in because it's not safe. Um, and then mm -hmm. we do the same thing when we're under pressure, when we have to move things forward. And that's often the situation and the reality that a lot of leaders are in all the time. They're mm -hmm. under pressure, 
move things forward, have to make decisions. They're, and the typical type of person that is drawn into a leadership position may also have those characteristics of being impatient and his impatience or her impatience got her even into that into that leadership position because that made them also ambitious. I mean, I'm just talking about, you know, what I've observed in certain leaders and the conversations that I've had on my podcast about the characteristics. And, and it's often leaders acknowledging that like, yeah, I am an impatient person. I, I love, I thrive on getting things done and, and progress and moving things forward. And so it's sometimes that impatience within ourselves. And then also the, the, the lack of leadership capacity to really hold space um, and be aware of what am I doing? When do these things occur? And so I wanted to ask you, you know, for a leader who's who's preparing for a town hall, for a leader who's leading a team, and you were talking about these different channels that we can set up, you know, so that we don't just have the town hall where you show face, um, so we have more interactions. Um, what's a what's a first step? Would you say for a leader is it to to start having more discussions with your people, or is it to start being practicing more self awareness, or is it educating yourself on psychological safety? Is it getting feedback? Like, how would you, or is it all of the above? <laughs> What's some practical advice? you would give leaders um, who are trying to build psychological safety in their organization? So um, to give people kind of a repeatable way of looking at anything um, of a where to start, we're always going through in our leadership growth through a process of awareness, responsibility, ownership. And so the first place to begin here is just awareness to get aware of um, when are you safe? When do you feel safe? What types of things like create a lack of safety in your body? Is it with your like superiors? Are there certain types of people that trigger that lack of safety? Are there certain um, activities um, or ways of being questioned that create a yourself? Get aware. And once you are aware of um, what triggers you and the responses that you have that um, create results that are different than the results you want. Now we can take responsibility. We can take responsibility for our responses. We can take responsibility for trying and learning about new actions. So this is a good place to learn. Like what are different types of psychological safety? What breaks them? This is a place to begin to go for feedback. Like, hey, like I am really curious about um, what I could be doing to um, bring more safety to this team. Asking one person in a one-on-one, -on -one. Um, maybe going to the person that you really like sense you don't have a safe relationship with and asking them. And as we take responsibility, we're going to try things. And because trying new things um, is hard, so I'm going to get it wrong. Um, and being really patient and forgiving with yourself when you're wrong to come back to the awareness that you got it wrong and choose to take responsibility again. Eventually, these practices become part of who we are and we're in ownership of them. And we know that when we practice uh, clearing things, when we practice going for feedback, it actually improves psychological safety. And when we set these practices up on our team, then we kind of become a self-cleaning oven such that breaks in safety get dealt with. We had a break in safety last week. Um, last week, if you were with us, the my internet failed um, and the live got glitchy and I, I couldn't even continue. And I was texting things that were kind of um, and coming from a place of stress um, and demanding of things that were not really Helena's responsibility. And so I called you up um, and I was like, hey, like, I'd like to clear how I was um, in this interaction. I'd like to, I'd like to like tell you, I, I'm not proud of who I was. And mm -hmm. well, like, had a real interesting share. Yeah, we did. Because for me, I, I realized, okay, we were in a moment of stress. Like this is, you know, like there was like fire shot test uh, texting. And I was like, okay, she's, she's stressed. So for me, the, the situation wasn't, wasn't actually triggering. Um, and so I kind of like, for me was like, okay, 
a kind of water under the bridge type of situation. Um, but then you, the fact of you calling me and wanting to clear and wanting to talk about how you didn't feel okay with how you handled the situation. I was like, Oh, okay. Um, that's how she, she dealt with that. Well, I appreciate it because first of all, I do feel like you care about how I felt during that situation. Um, which is something I, I have a follow-up question on for you because the factor caring matters a lot um, you, 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 for you to walk the talk, really. Um, but then the other thing, too, is I observe myself in my own relationships where I get much more comfortable with owning the fact that I'm not perfect. So when people that are more senior to you, um, more experienced than you, um, own their imperfections and you can see that it's continuous work in progress and that they're a continuous work in progress, it kind of allows you to take them off a pedestal, which you're constantly measuring yourself against. Um, so suddenly it's not like, oh, I need to reach this pedestal to be good enough. Then I'm going to be a leader. It's more like, oh no, I can be this now. And I'm expected to do this mm -hmm. now because my leader is doing it. They're my leaders doing the work now and they're not putting themselves on a pedestal and making themselves higher than I am, but they're actually showing up and doing the work. And so suddenly you get really curious about your own work and how you're, how you are showing up. And that becomes the measurement of comparison that you're like, Oh, I wonder when I'm not doing that and how I could be doing that, that better. And there are areas in my life where I have been doing that, but there are certainly areas in my life where I haven't, where I still get triggered mm -hmm. and that I still react like the five-year-old self sometimes where I'm just like, mm, and I resist and I don't want to be open. And I, you know, and I push back and, and if I'm, I'm in, and if I'm in a place of power, that's damaging, right? Like it's, it's like, Oh, okay. We can't talk to you. And then, you realize, oh, trust, trust was broken. Um, and so I think that's the, 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 honestly, the mo most powerful aspect of it is if you are working with someone who can create that psychological safety, who is showing up fully vulnerable and willing to work on themselves and own and talk about the gaps that they may have, then suddenly you're, it's like, it's like a piece of, it's like a golden nugget that you hand on. And then suddenly you're in other circles mm -hmm. where your leader is not even showing up and you're, you're, you're doing that. And so suddenly it's like a, you know, a forest fire that just catches and it's like suddenly everyone's doing it. Right. Um, but it is mm -hmm. challenging because you need the value of, you know, having that shared value of actually caring and wanting to um, show up vulnerable and, and, and wanting to do the work. Um, and as you say, you know, I mean, it requires a certain level of comfort within yourself to be able to take, to have the courage to show up vulnerably. Because, you yeah. know, what I've often observed is leaders um, showing up in meetings and sharing their personal, you know, personal things, um, stories and opening up and being vulnerable. And the back they got some backlash because they were working with people or leading people that had been um working in cultures of command and control where being in a position mm -hmm. of leader meant you had to exercise command and control and you have to exercise your expertise and your knowledge and if someone didn't do that they were actually lacked in credibility to these people yeah you know and and I, that's really challenging because you try, you think you're doing the right thing, but people aren't responding to that too. It's useful to appreciate that we're still in a transition time in our organizations. And so while Brene Brown has given us all um, such an incredible gift in the way she has brought us the power of vulnerability, um, that message and that culture shift has not made its way through all the places, especially into um, the places where people are really have really benefited from command and control, and they have reached a place uh, in the hierarchy that um, changing the system might look like a loss of power and a loss of earned recognition. Mm -hmm. uh, 
recognizing we're in this transition time. Um, as a leader, it is useful to, to read the room, like know how far to share, because we can create a space of vulnerability um, without losing um, our management of the space and our ownership of what's happening here as a leader. Coming back to that place of responsibility, um, responsibility takes courage um, because sometimes we get it wrong. Sometimes and we take our vulnerability too far and it becomes an overshare. I was talking about this with you before we got on. My willingness to be vulnerable um, is my superpower. And um, with that superpower comes the importance of knowing what's too far. Like what's so intimate that it's actually going to break the trust I have with my team that this is a professional space. Um, and we're focused here on work. Uh, and um, if I'm too vulnerable, then I almost create the expectation that you will be as well. And that's also a break in trust. And mm -hmm. so respecting though, that any time we move into something new, we are going to make mistakes and we're going to need to recalibrate and find a new way of doing, which is why responsibility is this repeated process. We don't learn something once or change our behavior once. Every new moment's new and we'll need to find a fresh um, response. And sometimes those will be wrong. And, but that repeated practice gives us that place of ownership such that it wasn't in question that for me that I needed to clean up with you around the, the, the tone of my texts. And when I do that, I relieve myself of like concern because I, I messed up. I wasn't who I wanted to be in that moment. And I can clean up and I can be in a learning space of be, endlessly becoming a better leader because I am. And so that capacity to be a learner and that option to be a learner and that safety to be a learner is what enables growth mindset in our organizations. And that mm -hmm. opportunity to challenge the way things are being done is the root of innovation in our organizations. Without challenge or safety, we don't get innovation because we're not innovation is fundamentally doing things a new way. And if it's not safe to challenge the old way of doing things, we're never going to move to the new way of doing things. And so psychological safety is really fundamental to creating organizations that can move forward into the future and create new revenue and innovate into the future. And you hit on something really important, which is that without care, we can't bring it. That's like hard. It's hard. A lot of things in our organizations we have set up to be effective and efficient without care. But psychological safety cannot be logically brought. It is a feeling and we can't actually create it on our teams if we don't care about them. And that is a growth edge, I think, for all of us to bring our care to work. And for me, care for others also starts with the ability of caring for myself. And so, you know, I observe a lot of uh, bitterness as well on, on, in people where it's like, well, I was never cared for throughout my entire career. And now I'm supposed to be this lovey dovey person. And I was, I was like that, you know, it's, it's hard and it's true, but I was listening to another podcast yesterday and they were mentioning that how care and self-love and self-compassion is often ridiculed by people like, oh my God, get out of here with this fluff, you know. But fundamentally, if we told people that it's at the root of attaining all their goals, <laughs> you know, whether it's innovating, creating that next great product, mobilizing people under a new vision, uh, moving people from inspiration into execution, starts with that because you need people enrolled and people need to feel seen and they want to be heard and they want to be able to express themselves and bring themselves to the table and their opinions. Um, then that's the way to go is start to care about how we feel in certain situations, right? Going back to that self-awareness and, and being aware of when we're triggered and, and understanding what situations and people trigger us and then giving space to everyone else feeling emotions at the workspace and being able to work through that and build a relationship that is safe to work through that because that's ultimately what, what it's doing. Yeah. You know, we have, um, 
for the last maybe 50 years, a really um, vital practice of transformation um, inside of our um, family and partnership relationships. Like we just have a whole wealth of work that's now been done for, to support people in their personal transformation inside of their intimate relationships in their family life. Um, but I happen to believe that the workplace is actually an incredible place to be undergoing your own personal transformation and to actually be working on yourself. Um, we're there most of the time, like eight hours a day is a lot of our, just a lot of our time. And it is still, it's relationships. We're working with other people. And so there is this constant feedback and opportunity to be looking at who I am and how I'm showing up to the world. And where do I get to um, transform my ways of being if I want to achieve the levels of um, leadership, capacity, creativity, output, innovation, whatever it is for you, um, really requires that you become somebody new. Because if you, who you were today, could do that thing, you already would have. And so we like if we want to achieve something new, we get to become somebody new. And I really believe that the workplace is just an incredible space to do that. Yeah, I agree. Um, if you want new actions, you new outcomes, different outcomes, better outcomes, you're going to have to change your actions and how you go about that. And the first step is self-awareness, um, stepping into responsibility and, and owning. Yeah. Owning that. And process. if you want support doing that, um, we have an online course um, that um, is incredibly affordable. We are looking for beta testers. Um, we're making it easy for you. And we would love to have you join us um, on the Creation Culture course. It's at your own pace. Uh, we go over um, all the core aspects of building that future ready team that is an individual. Um, it gives you opportunity to really gain these capacities yourself um, to do your own reflection so that you can then bring this these concepts and this work to your team. There's a whole great module on psychological safety that goes through these levels of safety that Timothy Clark explains, talks about the types of breaks we have in the organization and, and how to mend them, and also gives you several very concrete small practices like retrospectives that you can bring to your team um, to actually affect this change um, more broadly than just that internal process. But it's a great place to begin. Thanks, Terza. And if you have... Um more of a, a broader scale and you want to bring this to multiple teams or to your team, there's also reach out to us because we are um, also provide those services and the programmatic approach to um, changing culture and um, providing, building, helping you to build a, a culture of trust and of feedback. Um, so don't hesitate in, in using us as a resource too, if you just want to talk and spar on on, on this topic. And with that, thank you so much for tuning in this week again. We'll be back next week with another really great and um, exciting topic for you guys to um, better understand the change and transformation that we're currently experiencing at the workplace and to create a better future. And with that, thank you so much, everyone. And until next week. Bye.